Howdy there once again YouTube, my name is Ben Ferriolo, and looks like we got some good amount of venting going on at Old Faithful in the Upper Geyser Basin right now. Please like, share, and subscribe, and click the bell if you wish to be notified about new videos. Also, please visit my website, https colon slash slash monitor size dot wee -wee dot com for information on earthquake statistics, seismic image archives for a few volcanoes, my seismo blog, how to download seismograms and analyze them, and much more. This is the third monthly volcano update. This is for the month of September 2018. I will also be doing yearly reports as well. The earthquake counts I state are taken directly from the United States Geological Survey, USGS, and their partners, and are only earthquakes reported, not earthquakes recorded. In regards to earthquake counts, it is likely the majority of the time that the reported earthquake total for a given location and time period, especially during a swarm, is lower than the actual count of earthquakes in some cases drastically lower. This has to do with a multitude of factors, including inability to locate, lack of instruments, and other reasons that, to be honest, make no sense to me. It is my goal to eventually major in seismology and also study volcanology, but I do believe I am now properly equipped to give you guys a heads up if anything occurs at volcanoes throughout the United States. The volcanoes I will be doing monthly and yearly updates on will be Yellowstone Supervolcano, Long Valley Supervolcano, Newberry Caldera in Oregon, Mount Rainier, Mount St. Helens, Mount Hood, Mount Shasta, and Lassen Peak in California. Glacier Peak, a volcano that is about 50 miles or so east of me, has no monitoring instruments except one sometimes faulty seismograph. The Pacific Northwest Seismic Network is putting new instruments there soon, hopefully, and Glacier Peak will be added to the updates once monitor installation has been completed. In this video and other updates, we will look at earthquake and deformation counts. The time period of the earthquake count for this video is from 0 UTC, September 1st, 2018, to 2359 UTC, September 30th, 2018, and magnitudes are always going to be negative 0.5 and above. Yes, earthquakes can occur at negative magnitudes, but require sensitive seismographs to locate. I like to call these negative earthquakes micro minis. Every month's update will be uploaded a few days after the month in question has ended. As always, let's start first with Yelly. Here we are at Yellowstone Caldera Supervolcano. As you can see, the earthquake's right here. I don't know if you can see it very well, but uh, the colors are off. I wish you could change the colors of the dots. That would be nice. There have been 74 reported earthquake events, which is lower than other month totals. I have been seismically monitoring Yellowstone very closely, and I can confirm seismicity is lower during September 2018 than previous months. At least it seems to be. There have been no major or slightly major earthquake swarms for Yellowstone in the month of September 2018. However, there are hydrothermal changes taking place all over the park, especially at the Upper Geyser Basin, where Old Faithful resides, just behind Old Faithful on Geyser here. Hill. <laughs> Excuse me. Some people are saying this is the Nor Norris Geyser Basin, but that's not correct. Norris Basin is far north of the Upper Geyser Basin. The Norris Basin is where Steamboat Geyser resides. Now, the current understanding of these changes are minimal at best, but will be monitored very closely. It is good news, however, that these changes are not occurring in conjunction with rapid uplift and earthquake swarms. But, and I mean a big but, when a magma chamber expands, it grows hotter. The geyser and hot springs of Yellowstone are obviously powered by heat, and that heat comes only from the Yellowstone Magma Reservoir. Therefore, it is likely any expansion or increase in temperature of the magma chamber can cause hydrothermal changes to occur first, since they are most sensitive to temperature differentials. So please keep an eye out for increased uplift and large swarms in conjunction with larger hydrothermal changes than what we've been seeing right now. If these occur, then I will be monitoring, monitoring the area much closer, putting out updates for Yellowstone every week or so depending on the increase in activity that could be approaching. That would be the time to worry. When magma attempts to pierce the crust above it, forming an event known as magma intrusion, also known as magma injection, get this, just think about it for a second, the heat and the pressure against the rock surrounding it, and yes, there's always rock surrounding it, it's not like an empty chasm down there or something, there's rock surrounding it, that's why it's a magma chamber, it's just a chamber of magma, and everything else around it is rock, with cracks and fissures, 
and a bunch of different other weak spots around the top of the chamber. Now when the heat and the pressure push against the rock surrounding it, it will cause the rock to destabilize, causing at the very least a microquake swarm. Again and again I say, magma intrusion very, very rarely occurs with little to no earthquakes. It always causes an earthquake swarm simply because of the intense heat, pressure, and gas buildup. Also, the current steamboat eruption count for 2018, at the time of recording this, is 21 times. In order to beat the record of 29 eruptions in 1964, it must erupt 9 more times before the year is over. So this definitely is one of the most active years for Steamboat Geyser than we have seen for a long time. Here we are at the steamboat counter at volcanoes.usgs.gov. As you can see here, more steamboat eruptions have occurred in the month of September, look at that, than any other month within 2018. Now, hydrothermal activity does seem to be increasing along with steamboat eruptions, but seismicity remains far lower than what we would expect to see during these changes. Either that means these changes are short-lived, and they will only go on for the next few months or so, or that means the strongest events are still approaching. Please help me monitor this area accurately and correctly. Here we are back at Yellowstone with these earthquakes for the Yellowstone Supervolcanic Complex, the largest earthquake reported within this time period, occurred on September 11th, 2018 at 1330 UTC, and it was a magnitude 2.9 earthquake at 10.7 kilometers in depth. Right up here near Upper Falls and, uh, what is it? Ah, Tower Junction, that's it. I believe that is the location where this earthquake occurred. For your convenience, here's the seismogram spectrogram analysis image for the largest earthquake to occur at Yellowstone within the month of September. Notice the dominant frequencies between about 1 hertz and 15 hertz. And I'm going to say about 1 hertz to 10 hertz, around there. Making this about a mid-range frequency earthquake, but there really isn't a terminology for mid-range, so it is a high-frequency earthquake. A lower-frequency earthquake would show dominant frequencies about 5 hertz or less. Also, please note the length of time for this earthquake from start to finish was about 30 seconds or so. Here are the GPS deformation instruments for Yellowstone. Let's click this one. Here's the GPS deformation chart for the northern tip of Yellowstone Lake at station LKWY. Here is vertical uplift subsidence. Subsidence was occurring, but it seems we are about to see another period of uplift, possibly. Subsidence has ended, but it is too early to tell if this will be another large inflation event, as we have seen twice since 2005. You can see two humps right here. You can see the last data that was added. The blue dots show the ground is probably starting to rise, inflate again. Is this the beginning of a new uplift sequence? Interesting to note, the stations seeing the most dramatic changes in the uplift subsidence sequence since 2013 are the seismic stations that are sitting directly atop the magma reservoir. Also, looking at the middle chart, which shows north-south horizontal deformation, the ground seems to be starting to head north after heading south quickly. No change, really, on the east-west horizontal deformation chart, which is on the top right here. Now let's go back real quick and let's go to OFW2. Here's the GPS deformation chart for the Upper Geyser Basin near where Old Faithful resides. Same pattern here as well. Here is vertical deformation. The top two charts are almost always horizontal deformation patterns. Notice that the change in north-south deformation, which we witnessed just a second ago on the LKWY chart, does not show much on this instrument. It is currently unknown why that showed. But you can see, uplift does seem to be starting again, guys. And we're back to the map. Let's go to WL, WY, which is right here. And here's the deformation charts for WL, WY, which resides just a few miles northeast of LKWY at Yellowstone Lake. Again, this chart right here is uplift subsidence, or in other words, vertical. It seems uplift is being recorded on this station as well. However, it seems to be in a diminished form. That could have to do with WLWY being farther away from the magma chamber than station LKWY or OFW2 is. So is there an increased supply of magma into the reservoir right now? It has been theorized, and rightly so, that the uplift subsidence sequence is caused by increased magma supply. Well, that is it for Yellowstone Caldera for the month of September 2018. Again, please go to my website, https colon slash slash monitorsize.weebly.com for updates, blog posts, and much more. Keep an eye out for my coming videos as well. Whoops, I lied to you guys. Sorry, I am not done yet. 
Here we are. Now, real quick, this is the tilt meter for Seismic Station Borehole 208, which resides right next to LKWY on the northern tip of Yellowstone Lake, closest to the infamous 2008-2009 Yellowstone Lake injection event. This is the past seven days as of recording this video on October 4th. I forgot to save these images on October 1st, showing the past 7 and 30 days of activity for September, so I will just show the most recent activity. Next update, I will have the past full month's data. Again, this is the past 7 days. I believe the X plot is east-west and the Y plot is north-south. I believe. And please, 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 please correct me if I'm wrong about that. I do not use these as much as the deformation charts. But these still are a wonderful tool to use to see if uplift or any type of ground deformation is occurring. Now these instruments do not detect uplift subsidence in the way that GPS deformation instruments do. This detects the tilt and the slope of the ground around the instrument in question. Remember what we were taught in middle school? That when you see a chart, you must read all the labels first. Side, tops, and bottoms. All the labels first and then read the data. Well, that goes for us adults too, guys. Always look at how many microradians are shown first, and then look at the tilt data. Remember, one microradian, see how it says 67.4, 67.2, between here and here is only 0.2 microradians. One microradian is equivalent to 0 0.00006 degrees. That's 0 0.4 zeros, and six degrees is approximately the tilt caused by placing one dime under one end of a beam that is one half mile long guys that is really tiny that's why these instruments are awesome oh i almost forgot let's go down real quick and here's the past 30 days showing most of the days for september 2018 yeah i got some interesting activity here the bottom is 68.2 the top is 66.8 a microradian tilt differential of only 1.4 microradians, right? So from top to bottom, currently, this is only 1.4 microradian differential right here. This range is only 1.4, guys. So it doesn't seem deformation has been that extreme, but it is occurring. Now here we are at Yellowstone. I'm pretty sure this looks familiar to you. Here's Yellowstone Lake and West Thumb. Here is YLT, but look at this. Guys, we have a brand new seismic station available for public downloads. It is seismic station YDD, and it was just put in about a month or so ago on September 5th, 2018. This will replace the faulty H17A seismograph. So we do have a new one for data download. It's not showing on isthisthingon.org yet. I hope it will eventually. But yes, you can now download data from that. And it is in the same spot as H17A. And here we are at the Long Valley Supervolcanic Complex. There have been 409 earthquakes at Long Valley Caldera for the whole month of September. The majority of these events occurred within the center of the caldera itself. Actually, it's around the center of the caldera. I'm going to say probably the south, southwest portion of the caldera, I'm thinking. Which actually is the same way the ground is moving. The ground is actually moving, I think it's moving up towards the southwest. And I'll show that proof in just a second with the deformation charts. So we do see more earthquake swarms occurring on the deformation front. And there were some earthquakes beyond the base scattered around. This volcano is part of my seismic image archive on my website. The link for my website is below in the description box right under my email address if you wish to see the seismograms for Long Valley called there for September 2018. Now the largest event was a magnitude 2.9 earthquake at 2.2 kilometers in depth, which occurred on September 22nd, 2018 at 819 UTC. For your convenience, here's the seismogram spectrogram analysis image for the largest earthquake to occur at Long Valley Supervolcano within the month of September. Notice the dominant frequencies go pretty much up to 25 hertz, and most likely beyond 25 hertz too, so definitely making this a normal volcano tectonic high frequency earthquake. Also, please note the length of time for this earthquake from start to finish was about 30 seconds long or so, around 30 seconds. And here we have the deformation charts for Long Valley Caldera, looking at vertical chart P639 right here. It seems uplift has been almost constant since this graph started in November 2013. It is likely that this will continue and more swarms could break out at any time. 
A large magma intrusion event actually occurred at Long Valley in the late 90s. The constant uplift is obviously being caused by increased magma supply to the main reservoir. This, of course, will eventually lead to an eruption if it does not subside. Uplift has not been extreme, but is enough to warrant close attention over the next few years if it does not stop. The north-south horizontal deformation chart here in the middle shows some interesting deformation changes in the past few months. A lot of shaking going on, guys. A lot of ground movement going both north and south. So I don't know what's going on there. Let's go back real quick. Let's go to CA99. Here's the deformation chart for CA99, which resides just southwest of the instrument I previously showed. Now, this is what you have to watch out for. Notice if we go back to P639... Notice how this chart that I showed first for P639 starts in November 2013. Well, let's go back to CA99. Check this out. Well, this chart goes all the way back to 2001. Remember, the smaller the time frame, the more detail you will see and vice versa. And that does not just go for seismic web recorders, guys. That goes for uplift charts, too. If you keep the size of a chart the same, but increase the time frame of the data shown, it will show less and less detail. It looks like uplift is consistent here as well. Appears to have started around late 2011 or so, took a quick dip at the start of 2013, and has been rising ever since. The magma chamber currently houses enough magma to produce a super eruption if it decided to erupt today. The amount of magma melt at Long Valley is probably high at a higher percentage than at Yellowstone, and seismicity at Long Valley always seems to be higher than at Yellowstone. However, Yellowstone's earthquakes do seem to be larger in magnitude than most of what Long Valley sees. Well, at least some of the time. Long Valley Caldera and Yellowstone Caldera seem to be the most dangerous volcanoes in the United States, if not the world. Let's go back. Let's go to the center of the caldera, RDOM. And here's the deformation data for RDOM, which resides about three miles northwest of P639. Uplift continues here as well. Multiple instruments confirm that it is likely vertical. Southwest deformation will continue. Of course, that could change, but if increased deformation continues and large earthquake swarms occur on the deformation front, which would be the south-southwest edge of Long Valley, which, we, which is what we're actually seeing, it is a good idea to monitor the situation extremely closely. Long Valley is a very potentially hazardous supervolcano. The last eruption called Bishop Tuff, supposedly 760,000 years ago, was considered to be a super eruption. Not saying that 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 will happen again this year but the whole area even outside the perimeter of long valley is very volcanic you would be surprised the world and especially the united states is a lot more volcanic than people would even dare to admit and this super volcano does seem to be closer to an eruption than yellowstone is the professionals say not to worry and to be honest being a war reward is overrated but there is a difference between genuine panic and genuine worry i would hate to see people panic but worrying about something is not bad if you deal with it the right way However, with the amount of molten rock at such a shallow depth, with large seismicity and deformation, it starts to paint a pretty drastic picture. Mount St. Helens erupted 0 0.29 cubic miles of ash, and even rained ash in Denver, Colorado, while the ash plumes circled the world. Now, if 0 0.29 cubic miles can do that, what can 140 cubic miles or even 240 cubic miles do? Please monitor this volcano and protect your family and be prepared. God does not give us the spirit of fear, but of love, power, and of a sound mind. What happens, happens, and there is nothing, nothing we can do to stop the power of volcanoes, even when we think we can. Here are the earthquakes that have been reported for the Newberry Caldera area. Only one lonely earthquake right here was reported for Newberry for the whole month of September 2018. Now, if you wish to see the seismic image archives for Newberry Volcano for September 2018, then please visit my website. The link is below in the description box right under my email address. I have had some problems with data connections in regards to the networks near Cascade Range volcanoes, but that problem has finally been resolved as of yesterday. The largest event occurred, the only event really, occurred on September 14, 2018 at 457 UTC and was a magnitude 0.1 earthquake at 1.3 kilometers in depth, directly under the West Caldera Lake, Paulina Lake, that Newberry hosts. For your convenience, here is the seismogram spectrogram analysis image for the largest earthquake to occur at Newberry within the month of September. Notice the dominant frequencies between, wow, dominant frequencies are actually between 5 and 10 hertz. That's odd. Making this about 
I'm going to say a high frequency earthquake, because you can tell it even goes up to about 20 hertz. Also, please note the length of time for this tiny, tiny magnitude 0.1 earthquake from start to finish was about 12 to 15 seconds or so. Here we are at the deformation charts for Newberry Caldera in Oregon, just south of Bend, Oregon. All right. This is a different type of GPS deformation chart. The yellow line is vertical, in other words, uplift subsidence. Blue is east-west, and green is north-south. Uplift has been virtually negligible, except for a spike between 2014 and 2015. You can see other small spikes here and there, including one spike just after 2018 began, and another slightly larger spike occurring just a few months ago. So you can see right here, and right here. Sadly, it seems the data stream from this instrument is ending. At least that's what it seems like. I hope they do not take down this instrument. And unless they're replacing it with new ones, then that would be cool. We need GPS instruments here at Newberry just in case. By the way, speaking of this large spike right here, let's check the closest GPS station to this one, Norm. So it's from CPCO, which is what I just showed. Let's go to Norm. Here we are at the GPS station Norm, just northwest about a mile or so of the previous instrument I just showed. The only change we can see obviously occurred at about the same time as the spike and uplift that we saw in the previous graph. However, this time it is showing subsidence and says that it dipped to 10,000 meters below the ground. That is impossible, since that would be about 32,000 feet, the height an international flight flies at. Yeah, must be a mistake, otherwise the other graph I showed would have showed the same dip. However, it is interesting this mistake occurred right when the other station saw an interesting spike in uplift. Very odd. However, recently, uplift subsidence has remained at normal levels. And same goes for seismicity. Please remember that can change in the blink of an eye. It seems the data stream from this instrument could be ending as well. Let's pray that if so, they will put in new GPS instruments immediately. Now here we are at one of the most infamous Pacific Northwest volcanoes, Mount Rainier, which adds a beautiful but potentially deadly backdrop to the Seattle skyline. This is also a volcano that is part of my custom seismic image archive within my website. Simply go to the website link in the description box below that resides just below my email address. The seismic image archive is brand new so there's only one month's worth of data there right now. It is constantly being added to and I might add Mount Hood to it soon. There have been 30 earthquakes total for Mount Rainier within the month of September 8, 2018, with a very fast-paced but minor earthquake swarm on September 19th. There actually have been some very peculiar seismic events occurring at Mount Rainier lately that could signal some dramatic changes for the mountain. Lots and lots of glacier and ice movement as of late, with an extremely large event occurring on, on October 3rd, 2018, among many, many other events since the September 19th earthquake swarm. The current reason for this is unknown, but I do hope a bulge is not forming on Rainier. If a bulge were forming, we would see small earthquake swarms first, most likely, Large glacial movement, like we are seeing now, followed by larger earthquake swarms, most likely. I'm not saying a bulge is definitely forming. It is just one of many theories as to why avalanches and glacier quakes have been occurring a lot more than normal lately, even though it's pretty cold up there right now. I am putting out multiple blog posts about these events, so if you wish to analyze them with me, simply go to my website and go to the quote-unquote Seismo blog on my page. The largest event occurred on September 27th, 2018 at 11.48 UTC, and it was a magnitude 1.8 earthquake at 5.2 kilometers in depth. Surprisingly, most of the seismicity this time seems to be situated on the southern slope of Rainier, with a very lonely straggler just southeast of the volcano right down here. Almost in a straight line, you notice that? That's very odd. The earthquake patterns for this month are not major, but they are peculiar to say the least. Seismicity, again, remains low for now. However, please remember that could change in the blink of an eye. For your convenience, here's the seismogram spectrogram analysis image for the largest earthquake to occur at Mount Rainier within the month of September. Notice the dominant frequencies go beyond 25 hertz, making this a high frequency volcano tectonic earthquake. Also, please note the length of time for this earthquake from start to finish was about 20 seconds or so. And here we are at the deformation charts for Mount Rainier. Sadly, at Mount Rainier, they really need to add some new instruments. There are only two deformation recorders, actually they are called GPS instruments, at Mount Rainier capable of monitoring the volcano for eruptions. 
They are both on the eastern slope of Rainier, about halfway between the base and the summit. The first one here, M-U-I-R, is south of the other one I'll show in just a second. For the record, I do not like the multicolored charts. I really hope they switch to the blue charts soon since they are easier to read. Again, when seeing this type of GPS deformation chart, yellow is vertical, uplift subsidence, blue is east-west, and green is north-south deformation. It seems uplift and subsidence has been virtually negligible, with overall subsidence barely occurring. Last update, we noticed how there was a small spike in uplift forming, and I said that we would see where it goes. Well, it seems the spike grew in stature. Look at that. Almost just as tall as the spike right here. It's nothing major, but definitely seems like a small amount of uplift is occurring where the station is located. Remember, this chart runs on two-year intervals. This is the start of 2018 right here. This is the start of 2017 right here, right in the middle. And this is the start of 2016 right here. Hopefully, new monitors are added soon, both to the western and southern slopes of Mount Rainier. It seems from about November 2012 to January 2013, this monitor had a significant change in direction, about 0.12 meters within a very short period of time towards the northeast. Now let's go back, and let's go to CSHR right here, and wow, what a complete disappointment. This monitor CSHR, the only other GPS station actually on Mount Rainier's slope, has been discontinued since about October 2014. God knows why. Please ask USGS and PNSN to add more deformation instruments around the slope of this volcano. I doubt there are many other stations up here recording deformation. I really hope that USGS conducts actual geophysical observations for bulges and other concerns at Mount Rainier. I hope. And here we are at the volcano that gave my mother a very bad day on May 18, 1980, Mount St. Helens. This volcano pummeled my mother's house with inches of ash, and even rained ash on my dad's car in Denver, Colorado. The main Mount St. Helens eruption ejected 0.29 cubic miles of ash, compared to the possible 140 cubic miles of ash that Long Valley could eject during its coming eruption. When will it erupt? Who knows? There have only been 25 total earthquakes in Mount St. Helens for September 2018. Most of the events took place beneath the summit, right here. And with some other small earthquakes scattered around the base of the volcano and to the northeast, right here, which is where the largest earthquake occurred. The largest reported event that occurred within this month was a magnitude 1.5 earthquake at 11.3 kilometers in depth on September 4th, 2018 at 1753. For your convenience, here is the seismogram spectrogram analysis image for the largest earthquake to occur at Mount St. Helens within the month of September. Notice the dominant frequencies go up to about 25 hertz and probably go a little bit beyond, making this a high frequency volcano tectonic earthquake. However, this earthquake seems to be a little emergent. So I don't know what exactly caused this one. I don't, I'm not saying it's tectonic because its characteristics are very weird, but it does have a high frequency. Also notice this lasted about... 10 to 12 seconds or so. Here we are at the GPS deformation charts for Mount St. Helens in Washington State. Sadly, there are no GPS instruments available to the public for the actual dome itself within the St. Helens crater. So I picked P697, which I feel is the closest to the dome, but resides on the southeast rim of the summit. It seems the data stream for this instrument stopped gathering data around January 2018. Hopefully they do fix it. Again, yellow is vertical, blue is east-west, and green is north-south. It currently seems to be moving northwest slightly, with uplift spikes being seen at the beginning of each year, it seems. No signs of renewed substantial dome growth, and it appears St. Helens is still within background levels. However, as with any volcano, that can change in the blink of an eye. Magma likes to be independent and for sure has a mind of its own. The recent Kilauea eruptions are a testament to that fact. And although there are many different types of magma out there, guys, magma's magma. It's hot, and it's powerful, and it has a mind of its own, no matter what type it is. And here we are at the Mount Hood Volcano in northern Oregon, which straddles the border between Washington and Oregon. There have been only three reported earthquakes at Mount Hood for the month of September 2018, which occurred on the southern portion of the volcano, right here. The largest was a magnitude 0.7 earthquake at 4.0 kilometers in depth on September 17th, 2018 at 2231 UTC. 
For your convenience, here's the seismogram spectrogram analysis image for the largest earthquake to occur at Mount Hood within the month of September. Notice the dominant frequencies between about 5 hertz and I'm going to say about 20 hertz, making this a high frequency volcano tectonic earthquake. Also, please note the length of time for this earthquake from start to finish was about 12 seconds or so. And real quick, if you wish to hear about the strange, strange event that occurred on September 24, 2018, 15 miles west of Mount Hood, then please go to the Seismo blog on my website and go into the videos in my YouTube channel. Go to my YouTube channel, click videos, and look for the most recent video that talks about Mount Hood. This is the seismogram spectrogram analysis image of this event. I originally labeled it as a low frequency long period earthquake because it was originally labeled as an earthquake on the USGS site and PNSN. But then they changed it to a probable explosion, a quarry blast. But there's some very weird things involved. So if you want to see the weird things involved with this, go see the video and my blog post about it. Here we are at the GPS deformation charts for Mount Hood. Only two lonely guys. So let's click P791 first. Sadly, once again, it seems GPS deformation monitoring at this volcano is not as great as it should be. Only two GPS instruments and they reside on the southern base. It seems instrument P791 is useless since it stopped working around the summer of 2016. So that leaves us with the only other GPS deformation instrument available, MHTL. Let's go to it right now. Even though this station resides just west of the station I just showed on the southern base of Mount Hood, it still can give us good data, since it still seems to be in working condition. It seems deformation is basically neg negligible, with two spikes in subsidence, which is also called deflation, after the start of 2010, which is right about here, and after the start of this year, 2018, which is right here. Since this chart began in 2007, the ground has been slightly moving northeast, although at a very slow rate. Deformation and seismicity in Mount Hood remains at very low levels. Pretty low, at least for now. However, now it seems there is a small spike in uplift starting. We will see where this is heading and we'll update you about this in the October 2018 volcano update, which will be issued around November 4th or so. But you can see it's going up right here, so we'll see where that goes. Here is Mount Shasta Volcano, which resides just south of the California-Oregon border. Also, if you have ever driven from Southern Oregon into California using Interstate 5, you already know the volcano is quite large. Now, there were only four earthquakes reported for the whole month of September 2018, with the largest being a magnitude 1.6 earthquake at 8.5 kilometers in depth on September 21st, 2018 at 2014 UTC. For your convenience, here's the seismogram spectrogram analysis image for the largest earthquake to occur at Mount Shasta within the month of September. Notice the dominant frequencies between about 4 hertz to about, I'm going to say about 20 hertz, making this a high frequency volcano tectonic earthquake. Notice the length of time. It lasted a good amount of time, guys. That's about, let's see, 2015 15, 2014 55. I'm going to say it lasted about. 20 to 23 seconds or so, around there. Here we are at the GPS deformation charts for Mount Shasta. Let's pick P657 for today. Once again, there are no GPS instruments available to the public on the actual volcano itself. There is, however, multiple GPS instruments around the base that, quite possibly, could detect a new influx of magma within a deeper region. However, shallow deformation on the summit, a sign an eruption could be approaching, most likely would not be seen, except with human observation. However, just like other stratovolcanoes, seismicity would almost certainly increase prior to an eruption, simply because of the heat and power and gas buildup from magma injection events, which almost always occur prior to an eruption. It seems deformation and seismicity at Mount Shasta remain at low levels, and it looks like it's breathing. Isn't that weird? Now, here we are at the last volcano in the update. Remember, Glacier Peak and Washington State will be added to the update once new instruments are installed. But here is Lassen Peak, which is right here. This is Lassen Peak in this area. A volcano in Northern California, just 60 miles southeast of Mount Shasta. Again, for the month of September 2018, only 13 earthquakes were reported, the largest being a magnitude 1.0 earthquake at 1.9 kilometers in depth at, on September 11th, 2018 at 2034 UTC.
And for your convenience, here's the seismogram spectrogram analysis image for the largest earthquake to occur at Lassen Peak within the month of September. Now, it's kind of hard to see, but it is this right here, right here. There's some background activity going on. I don't know what it was, but you could definitely see the change is in this area, which is right here. So this is the earthquake. You could tell it had dominant frequencies that go up to about 20 hertz, making this a high frequency volcano tectonic earthquake. Notice that it lasted very short amount of time. Very, very short. Maybe, I'm going to say, 10 seconds max. Here we are at the GPS deformation instruments for Lassen Volcanic Center. We are going to be picking P666. Here we are at GPS instruments 666. Trust me, I would have picked a better name for this one. <laughs> On a more serious note, though, it does seem Lassen Peak is well set with GPS instruments, though it seems those instruments do go out once in a while. Remember, if any of you want to do the same thing, the same simple thing that I'm doing, all you have to do is go to volcanoes.usgs.gov and select the volcano you want to monitor. I must tell you though, if you wish to monitor seismographs and try to understand the cause of certain seismic events, please visit my website https colon slash slash monitorsize.weebly.com and go to the how to menu under the more drop down menu. So it seems P666 is showing multiple spikes of southeast uplift. Notice this is east-west horizontal deformation. This is north-south horizontal deformation. This is vertical uplift subsidence deformation. So you can see the multiple spikes of uplift towards the southeast. That is, the ground moved upwards in a southeastern direction. Remember, the bottom is vertical. In other words, uplift subsidence, the middle chart is north-south, and the top chart is east-west. You can tell these spikes coincide perfectly with one another, showing four distinct events, with each of the four events moving the same direction as the last. Vertical southeast movement with what seems to be each deformation event being larger than the last. You notice that? The four deformation events at Lassen Peak moving vertical southeast occurred about April 2014, about January 2015, March 2016, and February to March 2017. It seems that it was moving in a sort of a pattern, but skipped 2018 for some reason. Of course, we will keep monthly tabs on these areas I just talked about, and I would not be surprised if southeast uplift and Lassen Peak occurred again around December 2018 this year to about March 2019. If so, be wary of swarms occurring on the deformation front, occurring at Lassen Peak from the summit to beyond the base from about south to southeast. It seems around October 2017, uplift slightly increased and then decreased around April 2018. Looking at the most recent data, it does seem to be slowly rising again. So we will keep a close eye on this as well. However, it is unlikely Lassen Peak will erupt soon since its last major eruption was in 1917. Yes, they do have pictures of it. For your convenience, here are some images of the Lassen Peak eruption in... Oh, I was wrong. It's in 1915, not 1917. Here is one right here. Isn't that interesting? Here is a picture of Lassen Peak erupting right at the beginning of the eruption. And here is another image of the Lassen Peak eruption. Look at... Oh, that's not Lassen Peak. There, that's Lassen Peak. Look at how large that was, guys. It was a pretty, pretty large eruption. And here's from the distance. Yep, wow, the great eruption, Lassen Peak, May 22nd, 1915, California Historical Society. Wowza. And here's another image during its eruption. And here we are back at the wonderful Upper Geyser Basin, home to the infamous Old Faithful Geyser. Well, it seems, as usual, Yellowstone and Long Valley Caldera volcanoes have the highest seismicity counts out of all the volcanoes I showed for the month of September 2018. Of course, concerning activity at any of these volcanoes will warrant its own video and its own blog post on my website, especially if increased deformation and gas output is spotted in conjunction with increased seismicity, almost a sure sign of magma chambers growing restless for an approaching eruption. For those who watch my videos, please go check out my site. My website is helpful in conjunction with my YouTube videos. I will also be able to upload more information on there than if I was only making YouTube videos. So, if you like, 
please go check it out. This is the third monthly volcano update I have put out. The next monthly update will be for October 2018, which will be uploaded a few days after the month has ended. Sorry for being so late with this update for September 2018. Please visit my recent videos on my channel, which will include recent updates. The homepage seems to not work, so just go to my channel and press videos. Again, if you wish to learn how to download seismic data and analyze it yourself, seems like it's hard and time consuming, learning it takes a few days, but once you learn it, it is quick, it is accurate, it is way, way better than just looking at the seismographs online and going, hmm, wonder what that could be. Well, you can find out what it could be if you use seismic pro programs like Swarm and Waves and use either the Time Series URL Builder or the Data Select URL Builder from IRIS or NCEDC. I hope to someday be more educated in regards to volcanoes and earthquakes and hope to become a volcanic seismologist. Any support with that would be amazing. And no, I am not talking about money. I'm talking about personal support from acquaintances and people that I know. Thank you all and keep your heads up and please be prepared with, at the very least, three days of food and water per person within your household. Please double that per child you have under the age of 12, just in case. If any mistakes have occurred or I am wrong about something, please do not hesitate to let me know below in the comments section. I am a chill guy that actually likes constructive criticism. Sadly, the world, and especially some YouTubers, have too big of an ego right now to think constructive criticism is a good thing. Seriously, go watch some videos, and if you ever see a mistake, comment about that mistake and say, hey, you made a mistake, and see what their response is. I guarantee you, some of the time, some people will be open to that and say, oh, sorry for the mistake, I'll try to fix it. But guess what? A lot of the time, people are going to get mad at you for pointing out a mistake. I thought pointing out mistakes is how people learn. Hmm, I will always stand for the truth no matter where it leads. Now why? Because the truth really is hate or fear to those who hate or fear the truth. That really is the truth. That is what I've learned. God bless guys. Ben Ferriolo signing off.